on World News Tonight. Devastation in Italy. A rare storm hits northern Italy, wreaking havoc, especially in the Emilia-Romagna region, also prompting the cancellation of the Imola F1 Grand Prix. Bilateral talks. Chinese President Xi Jinping meets with Kyrgyzstan counterpart in the Central Asia Summit. TikTok banned. Montana becomes the first US state to ban TikTok, prompting other states to do the same. And a fantastic conclusion. The Sea Games draw to a close in Cambodia with spectacular ceremony. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News and we lead off tonight with the storm-ridden Italy. At least eight people died and thousands were evacuated from their homes as torrential rain battered Italy's northern Emilia-Romania region, triggering widespread floods. Several people died and thousands were evacuated from their homes as torrential rain battered Italy's northern Emilia-Romagna region, triggering widespread floods, officials said on Wednesday. The Coast Guard rescued residents in Faenza from their roofs. Italy's civil protection minister said some areas had received half their annual rainfall in just 36 hours, causing rivers to burst their banks, sending water cascading through towns and submerging thousands of acres of farmland. The torrential rains followed months of drought, which dried out the land, reducing its capacity to absorb water and worsening the impact of the floods, meteorologists said. The vice president of Emilia-Romagna said the rains were starting to ease later on Wednesday, but the river levels were still rising. This weekend's Formula One race in Imola, which is close to many of the worst hit areas, was called off after the government said the emergency services had to concentrate on the rescue operation. Muddy waters flowed through the streets in Faenza, forcing locals to flee to the top stories of their homes. Many were rescued by firefighters in dinghies. Road and rail links were blocked in numerous locations, and the mayors of many towns and cities, including Bologna, urged residents not to leave their homes. It was the second time this month that Emilia-Romagna has been battered by bad weather, with at least two people dying during storms at the beginning of May. Here's yet another climate warning, this time from the World Meteorological Organization. The world will likely warm up by 1.5 degrees Celsius within the next five years due to human activity and the El Nino weather pattern later this year. For the first time ever, global temperatures are now more likely than not to breach 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit within the next five years. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization on Wednesday. But that did not necessarily mean crossing the long-term warming threshold of 1.5 Celsius above pre-industrial levels set out in the 2015 Paris Agreement. Peter Italis is the WMO's Secretary General. There's a 66 percent chance that we would exceed 1.5 degrees during the coming, coming five years. And, uh, and there's 33 percent uh, probability that we would uh, see the whole coming five years uh, exceeding, exceeding that uh, threshold 1.5 degrees, which is, uh, of course, not very likely to happen. One thing that boosts the chance of hitting 1.5 degrees is an El Nino weather pattern expected in the coming months, when warmer waters in the tropical Pacific will heat the atmosphere above and push up global temperatures. It's a conclusion that uh, that, uh, that we haven't been able to, uh, to limit the warming so far and, uh, and we are still moving in the wrong, wrong direction. The warning came as another international team of scientists said record-breaking heat waves that hit large parts of South and Southeast Asia in April were made 30 times more likely by human-induced climate change. The region saw Bangladesh at its hottest in 50 years and Thailand and Laos also hit by temperatures that caused widespread infrastructure damage, power shortages and a spike in heat stroke. The scientists for the World Weather Attribution Group said humid heat waves that used to happen once a century in Bangladesh and India now tend to occur every five years, while the heat in Thailand and Laos would have been virtually impossible without climate change. 
G7 leaders meet in Hiroshima this week looking to tighten the screws further on Russia over the Ukraine war and agree on a united line to China's growing military and economic power. The three-day summit of leading develop, uh, developed democracies will cover everything from energy to AI, but a key focus will be targeting those who have helped Moscow blunt the impact of Western-led sanctions. U.S. President Joe Biden boarded Air Force One outside Washington Wednesday for a flight to Japan. He is participating in the Group of Seven Leaders Summit, or G7, meetings there starting Friday. A French official told he would call this the geopolitical seven, as the focus is expected to be on two countries not invited, China and Russia. When it comes to China, members are grappling with how to warn against what they see as its threat to global supply chains and economic security without alienating a key trading partner. President Biden had planned to address some of these issues on a visit to other countries in the hemisphere as well. This included a meeting in Australia with the Quad, an informal group of four countries that promotes an open Indo-Pacific, which Beijing sees as an attempt to push back against its growing influence in the region. That meeting is now taking place in Japan. Biden was asked about this before his departure. What message does this send um, that to DIG and, um, and, and Australia? I know that it was important to you to focus on Asia in this trip, but this is having to be put aside. Does this, is this almost a win for China? No. No, because we're still meeting. We still have four good allies. I think we've uh, shown recently that um, there is more senior level uh, engagement with uh, China. The U.S. relationship with China highlighted a congressional hearing Tuesday with several cabinet secretaries, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken, weighing in on its importance and its challenges. What we um, believe would be the, the right course is to uh, now see more senior level engagement in a, in a sustained way across uh, our administration and theirs, precisely so that we can make sure that at the very least we're, we're, we're talking to each other, that um, we are um, making very clear um, what we stand for, what our intent is, what we're looking for, as well as, where possible, uh, finding areas of cooperation. It's not only what's in our interest, but the rest of the world yes. looks to us to manage this relationship responsibly. We're determined to do that. Though differences on China among G7 members were put in sharp focus after French President Emmanuel Macron visited Beijing last month and called for the European Union to reduce its dependence on the United States. On Russia, the leaders are expected to tighten sanctions. The focus is on energy and exports aiding Moscow's war against Ukraine. Officials with direct knowledge of the talks have told while there are differences in strategy on how to end the conflict. The United States doesn't want to talk about a diplomatic path forward until it sees how the spring military offensive plays out, officials have said, even as its European allies wanted to have a diplomatic solution in hand. The G7 talks wrap up Sunday. China's President Xi Jinping is in central city of Zhang, where he is hosting his first ever summit with the leaders of five Central Asian nations, underlining Beijing's growing influence in a region that Russia has long considered its own backyard. The two-day event brings together the leaders of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, where countries are crucial to China's trillion-dollar belt and road initiative. It is being held in Zhang, the historic city that once marked the start of the fabled Silk Road. Yu Jun, Deputy Director General of the Chinese Foreign Minister's Department of European Central Asian Affairs, told a press briefing that the leaders will exchange their views on establishing a cooperation mechanism and on international and regional issues of concern. While the summit coincides with the high-profile G7 summit in Japan, analysts said that the significance of the China Central Asia summit was that it underlined the shifting patterns of influence in former Soviet states where Russia has long been influential. The United Nations Humanitarian Response Plan is seeking $2.56 billion to help people affected by the crisis in Sudan, a senior UN official stated, while the UN Refugee Agency is also seeking more funding to assist those forced to flee. In Port Sudan, the unloading of medical supplies. This Qatari flight touched down on Tuesday with a cargo of 35 metric tons, including medication and blood bags. 
Since Sudan's eruption of violence in April, a humanitarian crisis has been spiralling. On Wednesday, the United Nations said it was seeking nearly 2.6 billion US dollars to help millions of people. Here's Ramesh Rajasingham, head of the UN's Office for Humanitarian Coordination in Geneva. Today, 25 million people, more than half the population of Sudan, need humanitarian aid and, and protection. This is the highest number we have ever seen in the country. The response plan we are launching today reflects that new reality. Across Sudan, the fighting has uprooted around 1 million people, 220,000 of whom have fled into neighbouring states. The UN's refugee agency said it was seeking $472 million to provide assistance over the next six months. <coughs> Meanwhile, there has been no sign of let-up in Sudan's violent power struggle, which is now in its second month. Video released by the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces on Tuesday and Wednesday showed fighters around the Air Defense Forces command site in Khartoum. The location could be verified, but not the date. The army has been using airstrikes and shelling in a bid to root out RSF fighters. On Wednesday, residents reported hearing the sounds of anti-aircraft gunfire and drones. Civilians who have been seeking shelter said that power has been cut, while food and drinking water are in short supply. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan has stated that the Ukraine Black Sea grain deal has been extended for two more months, one day before Russia could have quit the pact over obstacles to its grain and fertilizer exports. The Black Sea grain deal that allows safe passage for ships bringing Ukrainian agricultural products through Russia's naval blockade has been saved from the brink of collapse for now. And with it, hope to help head off a mounting global food crisis. Son uzatmanın süresi... Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan made the announcement in a speech to his political party just a day before Russia could have quit the deal over obstacles to its own grain and fertilizer exports. The president says that, thanks to the efforts of Turkey and support of its Russian and Ukrainian friends, the Black Sea deal has been extended for two months. It was initially set to last 120 days from July last year. Ukraine is one of the world's biggest grain exporters, and Turkey and the United Nations have been hosting negotiations for the deal's continuance. The Ukrainian government is welcoming the extension, but says Russia must stop using food as a weapon and blackmail. Russia's government says the deal is first to help countries most in need, and it still has concerns over its own exports. Its food and fertilizer are not subject to Western sanctions, but Moscow says other restrictions, including on payments and logistics, amount to a de facto barrier. Montana Governor Greg Gainford signed legislation to ban Chinese-owned TikTok from operating in the state to protect residents from alleged intelligence gathering by China, making it the first U.S. state to ban the popular short video app. Montana has become the first U.S. state to ban TikTok. The Chinese-owned short video app has over 150 million American users and has been under scrutiny over whether it can be used by China for intelligence gathering. Legislation Montana passed on Wednesday prohibits Google or Apple app stores from offering TikTok within state lines. TikTok may also face fines if the Montana users offered access to their app, and additional fines of $10,000 per day if violations continue. The ban will take effect in January next year. In signing the bill, Montana Governor Greg Gianforte said on Twitter he was protecting residents' personal and private data from the Chinese Communist Party. Free speech. Calls from national security hawks and lawmakers to ban TikTok over fears the data of Americans could be passed to Beijing have faced backlash from influencers, some who rallied in Washington in March over what they say would be a violation of their free speech. In response to Montana's ban, TikTok, which is owned by Chinese tech company ByteDance, said in a statement the bill infringes on the First Amendment rights of the people of Montana. 
adding that they will defend the rights of our users inside and outside of Montana. The company has previously denied that it has ever shared data with the Chinese government and has said it would not do so if asked. TikTok faced an effort by former President Donald Trump to ban new downloads of the app, but it was challenged in court and never took effect. Some of the app's free speech allies include Democrats in Congress, including Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and First Amendment groups like the American Civil Liberties Union. Jenna Leventov is policy counsel at the ACLU and told Biz in April that Montana's ban would likely be challenged in court over constitutional reasons. TikTok is working on an initiative called Project Texas, which creates a standalone entity to store American user data in the US on servers operated by US tech company Oracle. The CEO of OpenAI, the startup behind ChatGPT, told a U.S. Senate panel that the use of artificial intelligence to interfere with election integrity is a significant area of concern, adding that it needs regulation to mitigate the risk of increasingly powerful AI systems. The chatbot tool ChatGPT has come center stage in the debate about artificial intelligence. Released late last year, it caused concern because students were using it to cheat on homework assignments. More broadly, it has raised fears about the ability of generative AI tools to mislead, violate copyright, upend jobs and even shape the outcome of elections. ChatGPT was released by a startup called OpenEye. Its CEO, Sam Altman, in a Senate hearing, recommended government intervention. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. We think that regulatory intervention by governments will be critical to mitigate the risks of increasingly powerful models. For example, the U.S. government might consider a combination of licensing and testing requirements for development and release of AI models above a threshold of capabilities. Too often, we have seen what happens when technology outpaces regulation. The Senator Richard Blumenthal, in his opening remarks as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, played a tape that sounded like him talking about artificial intelligence. However, it was not him at all. ...can perpetuate discrimination. The audio was an AI voice cloning software trained on my floor speeches. The remarks were written by chat GPT when it was asked how I would open this hearing. AI is moving incredibly fast. Also testifying was Professor Gary Marcus, one of a group of experts calling for open AI and other tech firms to pause their development of more powerful AI models for six months. There is no immediate sign Congress will craft sweeping new AI rules, as European lawmakers are doing. U.S. agencies, however, are promising to crack down on harmful AI products that break existing civil rights and consumer protection legislation. Prince Harry and his wife Meghan were involved in a chaotic car chase with paparazzi in New York that could have resulted in a catastrophic outcome similar to what took the life of, Prince, uh, of the princess mother, Princess Diana, in 1997. The Sussexes were pursued by photographers after leaving the Women of Vision Awards at the city's Zegfeld Ballroom. The couple were left shaken by the incident, although ultimately no one was hurt. Prince Harry, his wife Meghan and her mother were involved in a near catastrophic car chase involving paparazzi photographers in New York on Tuesday night, Harry's spokesperson said on Wednesday. The incident took place after they left the Miss Foundation for Women, where Meghan was honored for her work. This relentless pursuit, lasting over two hours, resulted in multiple near collisions involving other drivers on the road, pedestrians and two NYPD officers, said Prince Harry's spokesperson. The chase could have been fatal, said the spokesperson, and involved paparazzi driving on the sidewalk, running red lights and driving while taking pictures. New York Mayor Eric Adams said public safety should always come first. Uh, I thought that was a bit reckless and irresponsible. Harry has long spoken out about his anger over press intrusion, which he blames for his mother's death. Princess Diana was killed when her limousine crashed as it sped away from chasing paparazzi in Paris in 1997. Harry and Meghan stepped down from their royal duties in 2020, partly over what they described as intense media harassment. 
Perry is currently involved in numerous court cases in London where he has accused papers of using unlawful methods to target him and his family. British car plants will close with the loss of thousands of jobs unless the Brexit deal is swiftly renegotiated. Stellantis has warned as Ford added its voice to the latest warning from the auto industry since Britain left the European Union. The British government must renegotiate its Brexit deal or else car factories will shut. That was the warning from automaker Stellantis on Wednesday. The owner of Vauxhall, Peugeot and other brands said Britain's current deal with the EU is too costly. From next year, tougher post-Brexit rules come into force. It means firms like Stellantis would face tariffs when exporting electric vans to Europe. The car group wants Britain to extend the current rules on the sourcing of parts until 2027 instead. A government spokesperson said the business secretary had raised the issue with the EU. After Brexit, Britain's trade deal with the EU decreed 45% of the value of an EV must come from Britain or the EU from 2024 in order to avoid tariffs. Stellantis had announced a $126 million electric vehicle investment at a UK site in 2021. It said when it made that announcement it believed it would be able to create enough parts in Britain or Europe to meet the rules. But now it says it can't meet those rules of origin. It blamed factors including the war in Ukraine, supply issues and raw material cost inflation. The UK has also struggled to develop major battery factories for EVs. A major British car trade group also warned Parliament about its deal. The Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders said the EU and Britain didn't have the manufacturing capability to meet requirements for batteries and battery parts. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Four children from an indigenous community in Colombia were found alive in the south of the country more than two weeks after the plane they were travelling in crashed in thick jungle. The children were rescued by members of the military, firefighters and civil aviation authority officials in the dense jungle of Colombia's Caqueta province. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law a bill that bans gender-affirming medical care such as puberty blockers or hormone therapy for transgender youth and also enacts obstacles for adults to assess treatment. The wreck of the ill-fated Titanic ocean liner has been visualized in full for the first time as part of what researchers say is the largest underwater scanning project in history. The full-size 3D model was created with data gathered by two submersibles named Romeo and Juliet during a six-week expedition to the North Atlantic wreck site in summer 2022. King Charles hosted musicians, actors and television personalities at Buckingham Palace, the first such event since his coronation. The event also included winners for the Prince's Trust Award, a British youth charity set up by the Prince Charles in the 1970s that has helped millions of young people find work or create community projects. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we finish off tonight in the 32nd Southeast Asian Games as it drew to a close with a spectacular closing ceremony at the Maradok Techno National Stadium in Cambodia. Stay safe and have a good night.